Now, as we, are, we receive the Bible, let us stand and sing the invocation. Oh, on, sorry, before that, who is going to lead us in worship? Well, it's not Margaret, but if we do have Sandy back again. Sandy Muirhead is right here, and if you weren't here, you'll enjoy your worship this morning, uh, led by Sandy. A very warm welcome back again, Sandy. Nearly forgotten you, <laughs> but we didn't. So please now stand and sing the invocation as the Bible is brought in. Good morning. Good to be with you again after last week. And I just noticed something. I've got a stream down here, which I didn't see at all last week. And I was reading the words from up there, so it's much easier. Anyway, welcome. And for those of you who don't know, yes, I'm Sandy Muirhead. I'm session clerk at Karnak and Oakley. So I once again bring a welcome from there. Um, until five years ago, I was a lawyer in uh, practice in Dunfermline for 40 years. And then I felt a call to this ministry to be a reader around this particular area and help out with Sunday morning worship. So it's good to be with you. Now, the call to worship this morning, when I was here last week, I posed a question, what becomes of the brokenhearted? And my theme was partially based around Jimmy Ruffin's song from the 1960s of that title. And I talked about the need for us to become brokenhearted um, so that we can make ourselves right with God. And our hearts have to be guarded against the wiles of the enemy and purified. I also said it was extremely important that we actually want our hearts to be broken. And Paul emphasized this in his letter to Titus, which is our call to worship. Call to worship this morning. Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Eager to do what is good. And as Christians, we're chosen by God and he wants to purify our hearts so that we are eager to do what's good. So let's start our service this morning by singing a hymn which asks him to do just that. It's CH 496 and it's, you are before me, God, you are behind. I'm paying particular attention to the last verse where it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me and know my heart.
me. There is a slide. That's it. New creations. I come to you. When I was young at Christmas, perhaps usually in my stocking, but otherwise I'd get a, a toy which uh, was very simple, but which I enjoyed very much. And it was made, it was really plasticine. And you all remember plasticine. You can have the next slide. It's not called plasticine anymore. It's called modeling clay. Oh, the one that I gave you, one of the ones I gave you. There it is, modeling clay. It's called modeling clay now. It's not called plasticine anymore. And I like plasticine um, because it's really the poor man's Meccano. Now, you won't know Meccano, but you, a lot of you will remember Meccano. And it's all nuts and bolts, which I was never very good at. Um, being a lawyer, I certainly wasn't good with nuts and bolts. But I could do what I wanted with modeling clay. And I could, you could mold it into anything, couldn't you? Modeling clay or plasticine. And so I molded one today. And we're going to show you this little guy. Oh, no, it's, it's another one. That, oh, no, that's the right one, I think. Yes, that's the right one. That's the one made out of plasticine. Good. Yeah, a good little model out of plasticine. So I molded him out of plasticine. But, but these days, you're more used to Play-Doh, I think. Now, play, yeah, he said, yeah. Play-Doh, that's good. I know my grandkids love Play-Doh. So that's the Play-Doh. And Play-Doh's a bit different. And I molded a wee guy out of Play-Doh. And here he is, the next guy. There he is. That's the Play-Doh. I'm afraid he's lost his nose. But um, he had his nose there. But there, that's the guy made out of Play-Doh. Now, Play-Doh is a bit different from plasticine, I'm told. Yeah, it is. Plasticine's based um, on oil, and Play-Doh is water date based. And that means that you can put Play-Doh in the oven, and you can bake it. And if you bake it, it becomes permanent. You make a new little fellow that you can't just wash up and do, use again. And so I have this little guy whose hat has come off. I'll try and put it back on again. I might put it back on. But there he is. He's been baked in the oven. And he's... So you can't squash him up. He's there forever unless you break him. <laughs> yeah, he looks good, doesn't he? <laughs> Although I think he might have had some damage in transit. But, uh, but the point of this is that uh, this is what God does for us. He molds us. And he wants us to be like him. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to follow Jesus and to be purified by him. That's the way we follow him. And then he bakes us. And how he does that is we have all lots of trouble in this, in this world, lots of things that happen to us which we don't like, um, but we learn from them and become better people. And so he wants us to be new creations, like this little fellow here, permanent new creations. And that's what we're going to sing about. There was a, a chap called Paul in the Bible who said that we are new creations, and we're going to sing about that now. No more
An extra verse there, which we weren't expecting. Oh, our prayer. Let's pray. Father God, we're so grateful that in your grace you've chosen us to be part of your very own people. That in your love you are purifying us day by day, refining us into new creations. We thank you because of what you've done through Jesus and the cross. We can have confidence that we're no longer condemned. And we praise you for the release that such knowledge brings. But Father, we're conscious that although we are being molded, we're not yet perfect. Although you've deemed us worthy of release, we don't feel worthy. You may have broken our hearts, but within us there are still areas of rebellion. We may have decided to follow Jesus, but we've not yet put the world completely behind us. Lord, you know everything that's in our hearts. Help us to skim off the impurities that we may be better placed to follow you. Search us, O oh Lord, and know our hearts. Test us if necessary. Lord, we know that even in our trials, you're with us. Even if we stray from the closeness of your presence, you'll come searching for us. And when you find us, as you certainly will, you will place us safely back on the right path. Father, we praise you that when we're weak, we can always rely upon your strength. When we're poor in our spirit, you can fill us with joy. When we are empty, you flood our lives with peace. And when we're hurting, you hold us in your care. Lord, we know that no matter what we face, whatever we're trying to cope with, your love is sufficient for all our needs. Praise you, Lord, for your all-sufficient grace, which enables us as your chosen people to know that there's nothing that we can say and do that can prevent you from loving us. And we ask this morning that your spirit will guide, protect, empower us, so that all we say and all we do will bring honor to your name. For Christ's sake we ask this, and now pray the prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm not altogether certain when the children leave. <laughs> I'm getting the sign though, so. Bye-bye. I think Libby's got our readings for us this morning from Genesis and the first letter to the Corinthians. Hear the word of God from Genesis chapter 4. Adam lay with his wife Eve and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. So then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, 
where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied, am I my brother's keeper? And now we turn to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, reading uh, from chapter 3, from verse 18 through to chapter 4, verse 7. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are of Christ, and Christ is of God. This, then, is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ, and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of, the one, of one of us over the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Amen. And may God add his blessing to your reading this day. Thank you, Libby, for those readings. And now, I sense that maybe you didn't know the first thing too well, but maybe I was wrong in that. But uh, I don't know if you know the next one. It's from Mission Praise 921, Brian Dirksen, Purify My Heart. Fairly modern hymn. But uh, I'll have a dash at it if you don't know, I'm sorry. One of the, the drawbacks of being a reader that you come around to a church and you don't know what they know and what they don't know. You just choose what you want for yourself. It's a bit selfish. Purify my heart. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold and precious silver. Purify my heart. Let me be as gold, pure gold, refined as fire.
Lovely song that. Last week, when considering what becomes of the brokenhearted, we learned from the experiences of King David that ahead of all the sacrifices that we can possibly make in God's name, what he really requires of us is a broken heart. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And today, at the very beginning of this service, the first slide that was up, we were back in 60s pop culture, of course, with Scylla Black's Anyone Who Had a Heart. And in the lyrics, Scylla observes that anyone who had a heart would simply take me in his arms and always love me. Anyone who had a heart would simply take me in his arms and always love me. And like Jimmy Ruffin last week, she's talking about a broken relationship, but she goes on to say, why won't you? Why won't you love me as I need? But we serve a God who does love us in this way. A God who's willing to give us everything that we could possibly need. A God, the very instinct of whose heart is to take us in his arms and always love us. But in return, he wants us to have the same heart as his. He wants us to love him and to love others as we do ourselves. To be self-forgetful, if you like, to love others as we love ourselves. So this week, I'm going to be posing the question, what should our hearts look like if we have truly put our trust in Christ? And society these days seems to be obsessed with the self. There are self-help books which abound. Seminars are constantly being promoted on the internet and on TV and everywhere else, which are intended to improve our self-image. And similar commercials appear on TV because we're worth it, we're told. And for all sorts of fitness gadgets, and these suggest that if we use them, we can develop a physique which will enable us to be proud of ourselves and the way that we look. And much of the adult population is perhaps on some sort of permanent diet, not for health reasons necessarily, but to enable them to live up to their own expectations and the expectations of the fashion world, their friends. And whilst many of these things may be harmless, there is a sort of a darker side to it. The constant emphasis that we're being asked to place upon ourself and what we look like to others, both inside and outside of our bodies. And selfishness in small things can lead to a way of life where it becomes almost the norm. And it, this often has disastrous consequences. And in our Old Testament reading this morning, we heard the story of Cain and Abel containing a familiar question, am I my brother's keeper? After God had expelled Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden because of their disobedience, Cain killed his brother Abel because of his jealousy. Because God had found Abel's sacrifice to him acceptable, but he rejected Cain's. We're not told why this rejection took place, and on first hearing it does seem somewhat harsh. But reading between the lines, we can hazard an educated guess. The root cause of the rejection may well have been Cain's selfishness. He loved self more than he loved God. Abel was a keeper of flocks, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. But Cain brought his offering from the fruit of his tilled ground. Nothing wrong with that, you might think. But Abel brought his offering from the firstborn of his flock and their fat. And this shows that Abel's offering was extra special. It wasn't just an offering um, of, of his produce, of what he had. It was an offering of the first of his flock and their fat. And the first, firstborn was regarded as the best, and the fat of the animal was prized as a luxury. 
And we learn later in Leviticus that the fat of an animal was to be given to God when the animal was sacrificed. And the burning of fat in sacrifice before God is called a sweet aroma to the Lord. So in comparison, Cain's offering seems to be nowhere near his ground. He may have given of the fruit of his land, but there's no indication that it was the best, the first fruit. The impression given is he may have been holding back. Perhaps holding back the best of his produce for himself rather than sacrificing it to the Lord. And of course, it's the best that should be given to God. And perhaps there's a lesson there for all of us. Are we holding back the best of our own sacrifice? Are we perhaps giving a very limited amount, not just of our money, but of our time and our talents for the benefit of the Lord's kingdom? Or are we giving the first fruits? Are we giving the very best that we can give? The fat, if you like, as a sweet aroma to Christ. After the murder of Abel, the Lord, knowing true well what had happened, asked Cain where Abel was. And Cain's response is echoed down the centuries. I have no idea where he is. Am I my brother's cave keeper? I don't know. And despite his somewhat surly response, there's a grain of truth in what he says, though. No one is the absolute keeper of another person, and that we're not responsible for another's safety when we're not present and what they're thinking. But on the other hand, everyone does have responsibilities that we shouldn't shirk. And we know we shouldn't commit violent acts against our brother or sister, and nor should we allow others to do so. And Cain's reply, though, seems to indicate a total lack of any empathy, of any feeling at all for his brother. It doesn't really matter to him what his brother is doing or where he is. And of course, he knows he's dead. And this leads us neatly into the text of our New Testament reading this morning, which focuses upon Paul's first letter to the fledgling church at Corinth. And three years ago, in the heady days pre-COVID, my wife and I were fortunate enough to visit the ruined site of Corinth. I don't know if anyone here has been there. It's very interesting to walk through the ruins of old Corinth and, um, and think about Paul, think about where he lived, where he taught, and walking the same streets that he would have walked. And in particular, there's a big hill over Corinth, and it's the same view Paul would have had of that hill. It hasn't changed any. You could almost feel his presence as you walked around the ruined streets. And the church at Corinth, when Paul was writing, may have been young, but it was already battling with the selfishness of Cain. It was filled with division. It had originally been planted by Paul, but other evangelists had come along after him. And as a result, different people had formed different relationships with different ministers. It happens. So one person was mentored and discipled by Paul, and another perhaps by Apollos, who was another great teacher, and so on. But instead of everybody being happy that they had a relationship with Christ through either Paul, Apollos, or whoever, the relationships had become the basis for power plays within the local church. Sides had been taken, and divisions were already starting to cause cracks. One person would argue that he should be a leader because he was a disciple of the great Paul, and another that he should be in charge because Apollos had spoken so much better. In the passage read for us this morning, Paul is telling the Corinthians that the root cause of the division in their ranks and one of the main indicators of selfishness is their pride and their boasting. That is the reason why they can't get along with each other. And it's also the reason why we as a human race can't get along with each other, isn't it? Pride and boasting. Probably the reason why there's no peace in the world. More often than not, when relationships are disrupted, the root cause is pride. When you really boil it down, the root cause is pride. So let's have a look at exactly what it is that Paul is saying in the reading. In verse 21 of chapter 3, he gives the command, no more boasting. And in chapter 4, he asks, why do you boast? You might just as well have said, why are you being so selfish? He tells the Corinthians not to take pride in one man over another. So the long and the short of this is that in everything we do, we should avoid pridefulness. And indeed, wherever possible, we should search out humility. It's back to the old story of 
always putting yourself last, taking the lower seat at the table. And using football parlance, we're effectively to relegate self-esteem so it's no longer even a player in our league. Until the 20th century, traditional cultures tended to believe that the root cause of all the evil in the world was people thinking too much of themselves. Such cultures would ask, what's the reason for most of the crime and violence in the world? Why are people being abused? Why are folks so cruel? And traditionally, the answer was always what's known as hubris, not a common word these days. If we recognize it, we don't always understand it. Hubris. And it's actually the Greek word for pride, hubris, or thinking too much of ourselves. And I looked the word up in the dictionary when I came across it and found that another meaning for it is superciliousness. The only way to superciliousness. And that brought me up with a bit of a start because I remember when I was in my early 20s, and often an early 20 year old can act a bit pompous at home. And I, my mother used to say to me, Sammy, don't be so supercilious. I remember it well, and I've often told this story. It's all down to pride and hubris, thinking more of yourself than it's worth. These people who were supercilious thought they were the bee's knees. But in our modern Western culture, we seem to have developed the opposite point of view. Because it seems the basis for modern education and the way we treat our prisoners in our jails, the foundation for most of our laws, and the starting point for modern, modern counseling is the opposite of our thinking, the traditional concept of hubris. They think too much of themselves. Nowadays, many believe that people misbehave because they actually think too little of themselves. They lack self-esteem rather than because they have an excess of it. They do wrong because they have a low view of themselves rather than a too high lack self-esteem. And you may, may or may not agree with this, but what's intriguing is that in 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us an approach to self-esteem, which is totally different from traditional and modern cultures. In today's passage, Paul talks about three things. And these aren't my words, I've actually looked this up. So it's not me saying this. He talks about three things. He talks about the natural condition of the human self, otherwise the ego, self-transformation, the secret which Paul himself had discovered, that's the way to transform oneself, a bit like self-help using the Bible, which is what we should all be doing. Self-transformation. And thirdly, how our sense of self can be transformed and how we can become new creations. Rather like what I was talking to the children about. So let's have a look at this. Where does Paul, what does Paul have to say to the folk at Cap Corinth about the natural condition of the human person, the ego, if you like. In verse 6, he urges them not to have more pride in one person over another. And that's pretty obvious, you might think. Of course, pride in this context is wrong. However, here Paul's not using the word hubris when he talks about pride. Apparently, he's using a different word altogether. It's physio, which I'm told is an unusual word in Greek. Because used literally, it means overinflated swollen, distended beyond its proper size. And it's similar to the word bellows. You can think about bellows and how they, are, how they operate. And Paul is trying to teach his readers something particular about the human self, something that comes directly from the heart. We're back to it being a heart matter. Can you imagine for a moment something that might have become distended because too much air is being pumped into it? So much air that it's overinflated and ready to burst, a balloon perhaps. And Paul says that our ego, the overinflation of our ego is like that, that there's got to be a bursting point. And have you ever thought about the fact that you don't notice some of the parts of your body until there's something wrong with them? Yes, some of are, yeah. When we're walking around, we're not generally thinking about how fantastic our toes are today. But we <laughs> we probably only do that if we had previously had a problem with them. But we've had no problem at all. We probably don't think about them on a day-to-day -day basis. But the other day, I was cutting my toenails, and I cut into my toe. And I can tell you, I've been thinking about my toe ever since. It's, 
I've been paying a lot of attention to my toe. All of a sudden, from being quite innocuous, it's become quite noticeable. So it becomes a fact that we only notice parts of our body when things go wrong with them. But the ego is always drawing attention to itself. It's always saying, look at me, please look at me. It's always making us think about how good we look. Are we good enough to go out today? Are we good enough to go to church today? Or how bad we look? No, I look terrible today. I can't possibly go to church. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Uh, we do that. And so it wouldn't be hurt unless there was something wrong with it. And if I'm hurt by being called names, if any of you have been hurt by calling me names, it's because there's something wrong with your sense of self. Ego drawing attention to itself. It's saying, look at me, I'm important. And for this reason, it needs to be relegated. It's not always easy. And in his famous chapter on pride, in his book, Near Christianity, which I just happen to have, so I brought it along, C.S. Lewis, I don't know if you've ever read it, it's worth a read. C.S. Lewis says, and this is interesting, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only of having something more of it or something better than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they're not. They're proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. And if everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there'd be nothing to be proud about. That's so true, isn't it? When you think about it, we can't be proud about something that we possess if everybody else has it as well. And Paul says that as well as being overinflated, our ego is also quite a fragile thing. It thinks it's more, it's important, but really it's not. Anything that's overinflated is in danger of bursting or being burst like our bloom earlier. I read somewhere that a superiority complex and an inferiority complex are basically the same thing. They're both the result of overinflation. One is capable of being burst and the other is the state that exists after the bursting has taken place, deflation. So they're both arising out of the same cause. And it all comes back to pride. And that's what Paul's talking about to the Corinthians. All these people who are fighting over him, claiming a special relationship with him, are being so egotistical. And as a result, they are manifesting a tremendous amount of pride. They have to use their relationships for one-upmanship in the church. That's all that they can see. They have to be top down. And Paul wants the Corinthians to know the difference that the gospel can bring to our egos. In verses 3 and 4, he tells them how it completely transformed his own view of himself. So that his ego operates in a completely different way than the way it did previously. He says, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Paul is not looking to the Corinthians or to any human court for the verdict that he is a somebody, that he is a great chap, and that his teaching is better than somebody else. He doesn't care what people think of him. As long as he's doing God's will, and he knows he's doing God's will, he's close enough to understand that. And he's developed a humility that comes from a broken and a contrite heart. He's relegated his ego, his sense of self, so that it's no longer playing in his lead. True humility means we should stop connecting every experience and every conversation and every activity with ourselves and putting us in the center of these activities. In fact, we should stop thinking about ourselves altogether. And it's not always easy to do at all, nothing easy at all. We're always thinking about ourselves because we're always with ourselves. But it's sometimes called the freedom of self-forgetfulness. Once we have forgotten about ourselves, we're free. We actually feel a freedom to go and help others. And it brings the peace that only forgetting ourselves can bring. The peace that Jesus talked about on, um, on the night before he was betrayed. The peace that he gave to his disciples, not as the world gives. And here we can turn to C.S. Lewis again, who said, Humility is not thinking less of yourself. 
is thinking of yourself less. It's not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. And the moment that we believe in the gospel, God imputes Christ's perfect performance to us as if it were our own. We don't deserve it, but he does it because we have placed our faith in him. We're new creations. No more in condemnation. No matter what we've done, he judges us as perfect. And once our heart is broken by God, we no longer need to do things to make ourselves feel good or to impress others. We still do. We don't need to. We shouldn't. But we still do. The only person we really need to impress is God. And to him, if we're in Christ, it's Jesus as well, of course. We're already impressive to them, but we need to show it. Indeed, we're more than impressive. Because I'm going to come to one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I use it a lot. It's from 1 Peter. Each one of us is God's treasured possession. Peter says in his first letter, you're a chosen people. He's writing to believers. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're God's special possession. That's what we are. We're God's special possession. But why? Peter goes on to say, because I've chosen you so that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That's the reason. If we're a treasured possession of God, how can we possibly worry about what other people think of us? About how they ignore us sometimes. About what we look like in the mirror before we go out in the morning. Like Paul, we have to relegate our egos so they're no longer clamoring for our attention. And if, able, if we're able to do this, then maybe, just maybe, we can walk in God's freedom to the end of the way. And so let's sing about that now, walking in God's freedom to the end of the way. Lord of creation, to you be all praise. CH4 
Let's pray. First, a prayer to dedicate an offering today. Lord God, we give you today what's already yours. You provide so much for us. Blessings pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Thank you for affording us the ability to give just a little bit of our wealth back to you for your purposes. And the cheerful hearts to hear. C.S. Lewis once said that humility is self-forgetfulness. To be humble, we must first stop thinking about ourselves ahead of everyone else. So let's offer our prayers for other people. Lord God, help us to be humble. Help us never to place our own needs, the needs of our selfish egos, above the needs of other people. Our hymn that we just sung acknowledges, Lord, the fact that you are in the hearts of the humble, a heart that's been broken, which has become eager to do your will. So, Lord, if we've not done so already, we donate our hearts to you this morning. We ask that you mold them so that at all times your will may be done in and through us. Lord, we remember the folk that are not quite so fortunate as us, folk who remain enthralled to their selfish egos. We ask that through your grace, those captives may be released. We remember those suffering today because of the selfish actions of others. Those whose lives have been damaged because of someone else's neglect or action. Or whose future plans have been ruined by another's selfish thoughtlessness. Lord, may they know that the suffering Christ shares their pain. We pray for those in trouble because of unjust governments and oppressive regimes. For those imprisoned for their faith in Christ and for those who undergo torture, house arrest and harassment because they dare to challenge this selfishness. Lord, may they experience your hope and your joy in their hearts. We pray for those who suffer because of their poverty, for those who are hungry and even starving to death in a world of plenty, and for those who selfishly consume an unfair share of the world's resources, keeping others poor and in want. May you, Lord, in your grace, move the hearts of those who have much to help those who have little or nothing. We pray for those that we know who are currently suffering through illness, for those whose lives have lost all their fitness and strength, whose joy in life has been gradually sapped away. We pray for those whose sickness is lifelong and can't be cured. For those with a terminal illness, for those who suffer with them, selfishly, selflessly caring and feeling helpless to do any good. May they all know your peace and the compassion of Christ at this difficult time. We pray for our nation comforts us, Lord, to know that all leaders, good and bad, receive their authority only by your will, but we despair to see the ill feeling caused by leadership contests, by polarized views on different issues. Lord, where there's discord, may you bring union. We pray for the church here at St. Leonard's, Lord. We pray for the meeting this afternoon between the elders of the church's new grouping. We ask that you be with them guiding them in, into a new vision of a future. And always with the focus on you and your will. And finally, Lord, we pray for ourselves and for our families, for a new sense of the privilege that we have to be called your sons and your daughters, and to have the freedom that Christ has won for us through his death on the cross. Give us peace, Lord, in anything that's causing us concern right now. By your Holy Spirit, transform our attitudes and our values and empower us to live our lives in harmony with you. In Jesus' name, we ask all these things. Amen. And now let's uh, close our service this morning by singing a well-known hymn from the last century, which invites us to put self on the cross and Christ upon the throne. You know it well, Lord of the years. And CH4159, Lord of the Years.
Now may the God, the Father, prepare your journey. May Jesus, the Son, guide your footsteps. May the Spirit of life strengthen your body and the three-in-one watch over you on every road that you may follow in the week and weeks that lie ahead.